today we're going to uh, have a, a short conversation. And before that, we're just going to give a, a few introductions. And um, with that, I'm going to hand it over to one of EPHO's board members, Stevie, to start us off. Good evening. Welcome. My name is Stevie Dawson, and I'm a resident of affordable housing. I'm a member of EPHO, and I'm a member of EPHO's board. The East Bay Housing Organizations, EPHO, has been working with our members since 1984 to create, protect, and preserve affordable housing for low-income communities. And we do this by advocating, organizing, educating, and creating coalition. We believe that communities are the most powerful and healthy when they have quality affordable homes for all. And we celebrate Affordable Housing Month to draw attention to this housing crisis. We want those people who are most affected by the housing crisis to be able to shape their very own futures and navigate today's difficult environment. We also want to educate the public about what affordable housing looks like when we all work together to create the just and thriving communities that we need. So what you do today is more important than ever before for advancing social and racial justice, prosperity and sustainability. Also, EBHO is excited to release our new study room, which replaces the affordable housing guidebook that EBHO has created for a decade. The study room will have the same goals as the guidebook to educate and to serve as a knowledge base. The study room will be our online hub for the new evergreen content created by EBHO and our members to share valuable research and education tools. So please sign up on the EBHO website to receive the announcement about the launch of the study room. And lastly, if you're not already a member of EBHO, I invite you to join me as a proud EBHO member with our, your support, our collective impact grows and together we can create an East Bay where everyone is housed and everyone lives in beloved community. But don't forget, go to the EBHO website, ebho.org, become a member there. You can renew your membership there and you can sign up for the study room launch announcement. So thank you very much for being here and enjoy the discussion. I appreciate it. Um, and also, I, I just want to acknowledge that I want to acknowledge the sponsors that made our Affordable Housing Month possible. Um, you can see them here, perhaps, again, with the tech issues. Um, so thank you to sponsors of Affordable Housing Month. And please do come out to our other Affordable Housing Month events, including our kickoff on Thursday. And we have with us tonight um, the filmmaker of this film that we just viewed. And Spencer is going to share briefly some information about how this film that we watched tonight and this event is part of actually a longer series of events. So Spencer, would you like to share? Uh, thank you so much for that opportunity. And um, really, it's just an honor to be part of uh, this event um, and to know uh, it's kicking off uh, the Affordable uh, Housing uh, Week, or at least part of the uh, Affordable Housing Week um, for East Bay housing organizations. Really, it's just uh, so awesome that Alice Street got to be part of uh, what you all are doing. Um, so thanks again. And uh, yeah, I did have a couple quick things I wanted to share um, for one. Uh, just a big thank you again to East Bay Housing Organizations for your mission, the work you do, your community, um, and having us part of it. Um, my cat's like meowing in the background. <laughs> um, and um, let's see. Um, I wanted to also big, uh, give a big thanks to uh, Leilan uh, for being part of this call tonight. And I'm really actually just um, excited about the conversation that's going to take place. I'll be kind of quick, but. Um, as uh, Grover just mentioned, this um, screening is actually kicking off a whole um, impact tour with Alice Street. 
uh, where Alice Street's going to be um, uh, shown in communities throughout California, uh, mostly those impacted by gentrification. Um, and similar conversations like the one tonight will be uh, taking place across the state and beyond. Um, so just wanted to let you know that you guys, you all are actually part of um, the, the kickoff screening for about um, eight uh, screenings coming up, uh, including uh, we'll be in Oakland at the Fist Up Film Festival in two weeks on the 20th. Then uh, we'll be in Calgary uh, for a, a conference of urban planners, uh, Portland Museum of Art in, in Portland, Maine um, at the end of the month, Fresno, Santa Cruz, East Lansing, Michigan, Sebastopol Film Festival, San Luis Obispo, and Los Angeles. Um, so this is a whole impact tour, and we wanted to thank the California Arts Council and the San Francisco Foundation for supporting that. Um, and also we'll be having a free conference at the end of it all where we want to bring people who have attended these screenings um, together uh, to have a conference. You can check out alicestreetfilm.com for more information and um, please sign up for our newsletter if you're, if you're drawn to it. Um, but again, thanks so much and just excited about the conversation that's going to take place here. Awesome, thank you. And feel free to drop those links in the chat box if you want for people. All right, next up, um, I'm excited to hear this conversation between Leilan Sandra Huen, who is um, featured in the film and a leader in the Oakland Chinatown Coalition, which works to secure community benefits agreements with developers and advocate for citywide policies to ensure equitable development. And Leilan will be in conversation with Dolores Tejada, who's our lead organizer, who also uh, leads our community benefits agreements work. So I hand it off to you, Dolores. Thank you. And just to note, um, please use the chat box as a way to continue the conversation, although I won't be able to um, refer to it much. We will have a little bit of time uh, to for some additional questions from, from you all, from the audience. Um, hi, Leilan, how are you? Hi, Dolores. Good. Great to be here. Awesome. Thanks. Hippo, folks. <laughs> Yay. Uh, thanks for joining us. And it was really great to see um, the work and not just great, but a lot of other words, <laughs> um, frustrating in some moments um, that took place in the film. And it really showed that um, community members are key stakeholders in uh, not only in our communities, they shape our communities, right? Okay. And so you were a part of this film and we know about your work um, as a part of the Oakland Chinatown Coalition. Can you share what you remember about this time and this process? <laughs> oh, so much. <laughs> Where to start? Um, I mean, you all kind of saw a lot of it unfold, I think, in the film, um, really being inspired by this intersection of Alice and 14th and kind of the synergy between the communities that exist there. Um, but, you know, a lot of the relationships, of course, that kind of um, allowed the organizing to happen um, came out of years of relationship building, you know, with folks like in the Community Rejuvenation Project. I had known for many years and they were telling me about this mural that was being created um, at the uh, site of the development and um, you know I knew many of the people on the mural and and when it was threatened you know um, it became a symbol of uh, the gentrification displacement that was uh, happening and is happening in Oakland um, so you know, I think that was really a moment of um, folks across Oakland really beginning to feel, um, you know, threatened that our, our cultural assets, right, that we had seen happen across the Bay, um, you know, begin to encroach on, on our culture and everything that we love about Oakland um, in Oakland and having folks begin to feel solidarity and this, this need to come together and kind of protect what we love about Oakland. Um, so, yeah, the synergy with the Black Arts Movement and Business District, also, you know, relationships that had been there, but also new ones were created during that time. Um, and we just saw it as a moment where both of our communities were really being impacted by all these new developments coming in very quickly because of, partly because of the impact fees and the timeline there um, and how that came down. And so it was all kind of happening all at once. And so that one development became four developments very quickly um, in just a span of a few years. And it was, of course, 
course at a time where we saw the planning commission kind of continuing to rubber stamp even though um, you know Oakland was now a very hot commodity and um, we could begin to ask for things and to be part of these developments. Yeah and I think I agree that it it kind of was the beginning of this you know gentrification has been happening for a long, long time. There's a deep history of gentrification in Oakland, right? Mm -hmm. And this showed the like new millennial version <laughs> of gentrification mm -hmm. that's happening. This wave, and, yes. Yeah, this this next wave, as you said. Yeah. Um, and yeah, the mural is a central part of the film and shows a battle over communal space um, and who gets to make decisions about land and, and what parts of our community get represented publicly. Right. Um, so what about the process did you think were effective ways to hold the complexity of community decision making and what didn't work? Mm. <laughs> and these questions oh, yeah. are very selfish because <laughs> I'm in a CBA process right now. Right. So I'm like, tell me everything. No, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. It is it is a um a complex and messy process. <laughs> Um, but yeah, thank you for speaking to the long history of how um, we have struggled over land and power um, in Oakland and many, you know, and everywhere um, for so long, because of course, yes, this is within the context of, of Chinatown, um, you know, of course, the Black community in many different ways in different areas being uh, displaced for, you know, decades and centuries. Um, and so within that kind of context, um, you know, a lot of the anger and a lot of the, that the feelings build um, and a lot of that trauma has happened right um, because of the displacement because of you know divisions that have been fostered within the community um, sometimes it is hard to build that coalition and and repair the relationships as you're going through the process right um, in some ways it can be yeah very unifying I think experience um, for the community uh, to come together it takes many many hours of being in meetings <laughs> to really hash out you know what are the things that we want to see in these new developments um, what are our needs as communities and trying to get stakeholders from you know youth groups and senior groups and all the different kind of community-based organizations and um, yeah different stakeholders at the table and to to agree on what's the right things um, to push for what are the things that we really need as a community as a neighborhood yeah to to have uh, equitable development and, and to make sure that we are mitigating the impacts um, of displacement and gentrification um, so that has been um, you know a beautiful and um, very challenging process sometimes uh, definitely when there became kind of um, groups who would begin to splinter off of the process that was very challenging for us um, you know sometimes there's incentives or the developers will begin to approach folks who um, you know could be you know quote unquote bought off or um, you know incentivized to support the project because they're being given some certain amount of money or whatnot and so we created instead um, an anti-displacement fund for the neighborhood that was basically an amount of money that then the community would have representatives to sit on um, in terms of a process and a committee to decide then how the funds were going to be spent later you know after the process instead of different groups being able to be uh, you know, yeah, for lack of a better term, bought off um, within that process. So we really tried very hard to, you know, keep kind of the divisions and the splintering from happening and trying to keep uh, community unity when negotiating with private developers. Yeah. Um, can you share, is there like a, a, a positive relationship from that relationship building you did, you did or um, the coalitions you were a part of? Um, what What is, uh, kind of a, a positive part of the process that you remember yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the coalition with the Black Arts Movement and Business District was uh, a really um, beautiful and inspiring one that you saw in the film, and it did grow, you know, out of partly the, the, the process of the film, um, you know, the, all of the community engagement work that Spencer and Desi had done in the creation of the mural um, to engage both of the communities. And then it was, you know, it became a rallying point for both communities to come together. Um, so, you know, that organizing kind of 
created and solidified bonds um, that have then uh, gone on to exist for, you know, the, um, the Kaiser Convention building um, for the A's Stadium uh, and other projects as well. So those coalitions and um, relationships have continued um, to help, you know, protect our neighborhoods since yeah. then. Yeah. I want to ju jump back a little bit and ask about the community benefits process for for uh, the folks who were invested in in Ava Street. Um, and what do you think? What do you think is like your? Um, I guess like what what were some of the things that you were hoping would come out of the community benefits process like what what in which ways did it empower the community and even though it didn't end up um being happening like uh, uh how do you think that led to the ultimate to the fund being created and to the folks in that area having decision making power mm -hmm. Um, well, we definitely wanted to see more actual affordable housing be built in these projects. Um, that's definitely a big one. Um, that was far more challenging than we had expected. Um, you know, the developers really fought tooth and nail on that one. And of course, you know, it hits their bottom line. And, and we were really, you know, we brought in hundreds of people into city council meetings and planning commission meetings to really try to make the case and, and to, to really, that was the that was the top prize <laughs> that we really wanted. And it was because of uh, Ibaldsi's work on the W12 project um, that wasn't detailed in this film, but um, was a big part of the organizing in those years. Um, they were able to purchase uh, a piece of the land that's part of the W12 project in Chinatown and turn that into 60 affordable housing units. Um, and so we needed that affordable housing developer to really partner with us and the developer to make that one happen. And then we were able to convince um, the project at Franklin and 14th to include some small percentage. I think they ended up choosing 5% to, you know, 5 percentage of uh, affordable units for their building. Um, but that was definitely something that we kind of wanted to see that, um, you know, ideally we, we would have had more of. Um, but I think definitely in terms of the process of uh, generating new ideas, like having public art advisory boards and having retail advisory boards and having community members sit on those boards so we can make sure that in these new developments, we had local retail coming into these spaces, right? That we had um, public art that actually reflected our neighborhoods and engaged, you know, the people in the neighborhoods who've been there for a really long time. Um, those were new ideas that came out of the process um, that we're really excited about. Awesome. And another selfish question, which is, what lessons should I, well, not just me, but everyone, right? Should we carry for future CBA community benefits agreements opportunities um, that you think are important to, to name right now? Yeah, we had so many lessons. Um, definitely that one about kind of making sure that there wasn't divide and conquer um, is a big one. Um, we realized just how much work and how much effort really goes into, you know, into, into doing it successfully. Um, most of us were volunteer organizers, you know, grassroots organizers who weren't being um, compensated for this work. And so, you know, definitely like you can only go for so many years, you know, like that and, and in such an intensive process with developers who are quite um, disrespectful to the community and, and not nourishing to the spirit um, to kind of sustain you know, in terms of, you know, our own emotional health and, and sustainability as a community, I'd say that was a big takeaway. Um, and so we knew that we would have to try to find some kinds of resources and sustainability to really sustain this kind of work. Um, so I think, you know, EBHO is a, is a great example of an organization that can, you know, yeah, resource some of this work to happen in a more sustainable way. Awesome. Thank you. And I definitely want to ask if folks who are with us tonight have questions um, for you. Um, yeah. I appreciate you sharing your insight. Um, definitely taking with me that 
you know, as any good organizer knows, relationship building <laughs> is very um, important. And it looks like we have one hand up. So let me see if I can't, okay, I'm not co-host, so I can't unmute you, but um, we have a hand up. Please say your name and ask your question. Thanks for joining us. Hi, uh, my name is Harriet. I do have a long relationship with um, the Malanga and the city of Oakland. My question has to do with the A's uh, ballpark, which I'm absolutely, totally against. Uh, what is the community benefit being proposed in that situation since the A's have asked the council, which is predominantly new, to make a decision before the, uh, before the summer recess? So what is the community benefit that you see or anybody sees? <laughs> yeah, that might be a question more for me. Yeah, um, you might be more than me, actually. Yeah, so we've been working, EBHO has been working for the past 18 months, even pre-pandemic, um, on... Uh, as a part of a coalition in, that includes, uh, that we're a part of Oakland United, that includes mm -hmm. uh, many community-based groups. Uh, and we participated in the city CBA process. So the city mm -hmm. held a process to create a community benefits agreement, mm -hmm. um, or really like, uh, like, and that included a term sheet um, that is available, that is public record. So that should be open. What, um, what community really wanted was, was job with the, the basic things that we are consistently fighting for. We want good jobs. We want programs um, and opportunities for young people. Um, we want housing and uh, housing for for people most in, for for the people most impacted. We want um, affordable housing. So uh, there is an extensive um, list of the things that we wanted to do, and and the CBA because it's a legally binding document um we want our city to support us in making sure that the um, a's agree to it if they are going to build at howard's terminal um we know now that howard's uh, that the a's have submitted a proposal for sure. um for the site and in their proposal did not mention the extensive process that we went through did not mention the cba instead Thank they're kind you. of and they they actually did not mention affordable, they maybe said a, a couple sentences on affordable housing. No. Um, no. So um, the A's want to push for city council to make a decision before the end of summer, right. but uh, we don't have to, we don't have, the, the city council nor community has to stand behind that at all. And so we are organizing and we continue to, we, we gave comments and we submitted public comment as well um, with regard to the, um, the, the, the draft EIR report that also came out, the environmental impact report. Right, so that's, kind of that's my impact. concern. That's yeah. my concern because you're on landfill that's already toxic and um, that recycling place has already had to give benefits to West Oakland because mm -hmm. they were found guilty <laughs> so anyway, thank you. Um, thank you. Yeah. So we're in it right now. Which we're still in it um, with with the uh, um, Howard's terminal site. Um, so we have a question for Leilan. Thank you so much for your question, by the way. Um, so Miss Alma Blackwell is asking, what was the fight like establishing the Affordable Housing Trust Fund as part of the CBA? For the city, is there an oversight committee for for how these funds get used? Yeah, so we begin with a neighborhood-based um, fund, anti-displacement fund, and so we um, put out a call to have uh, anybody in the community uh, create, you know, an application um, to be on this committee. And we did select um, certain seats that would represent different constituencies within the community. It was based off of um, the work that SF Soma had done in their Soma Cultural Arts Fund, um, and they actually have 
it, it's really interesting, um, and, and I think it's still there, that every square footage that a developer is building, they actually have a certain amount of money that goes into this fund. Um, so it's actually within, you know, the policies, um, but they created a kind of a representative community council of folks who represented, you know, folks who represented seniors or folks who represented, you know, homeless folks or homeless services, um, folks who represented youth groups, you know, represented arts uh, groups as well. So different folks uh, to make sure we have diversity. And so we put that call out, got applications, and then kind of, um, you know, had the two groups who were involved in the negotiation of the CBAs, the Chinatown Coalition of the Black Arts Movement and Business District, um, help choose a good group that was representative. Um, we brought in a consultant to kind of go through a process of decision making around putting out the call, you know, deciding what we wanted to see um, in terms of applications for the fund, um, and then uh, deciding on and reviewing the, the applications for the fund. Um, and we were also trying to um, coordinate a little bit with the way that the block grants um, process had gone in District 2 um, and District 3, I believe. Um, so trying to align it with some of the existing resources that were going out into the community. Um, and then, yeah, and then distributed uh, to the group. So um, I think what we did was we won about $450,000 for the fund. Um, and we did, I think, the first round of 150,000 and wanted to um, put some of it aside to kind of try to grow. Uh, we partnered with the East Bay Community Foundation to hold the funds um, and then try to help us grow some of the funds so that it could be a little bit sustainable. And then I think there's gonna be a second round as well. So that's a little bit of the process. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that insight. Um, and so, uh, oh, sorry, I'm just reading the chat as well. I should, <laughs> I'm like, okay. Um, so there's a question again for me. So uh, I appreciate this, which is how to engage in the CBA work that EBHO is currently doing. Connect with me. Um, I'll put my address in the chat, my email address in the chat box. Um, and we definitely are going to continue to, to stay, to, to fight for affordable housing and um, and all the components that our communities deserve. Um, and I think that's it. That's, that's the end of our, our time together. So I appreciate your wisdom so much and the work that you did. Um, uh, really appreciative and grateful to, um, to the director of this film, Spencer, and for sharing it with us and to our community who showed out today um, to watch it definitely keep telling folks about this film. Um, I think it illustrates um, it illustrates a lot of a lot of lessons that we all need to know about if we're going to exist um, in Oakland, uh, in this community in general, and and um, fight for equity. And if I can share before we log off, um, I just shared a report that I worked on um, traveling around the country and looking at anti-displacement strategies specifically within uh, Chinatowns and API communities across the country. Um, so it just has a lot of good policy stuff. I know I've shared it um, with a few EBHO folks and some of our city council members and some of the policies are kind of moving forward in Oakland, um, but there's just a lot of really good stuff about what we're lacking in Oakland in terms of really equitable participatory development processes. Um, the other cities like Philadelphia and uh, Seattle and the Twin Cities actually have that we don't have. So would love for EBHO to um, work on advocating for, for some of these policies because that's really what we need kind of structurally um, so that we don't always have a, as a community, have to be the ones forced to organize all the time. You know, a lot of this should really be policy. Yes. Thank you so much. For sure. And thank you everybody for joining us. Have a good evening. Thank you all. Bye. Good night. Take care. Good night. Bye. Thank you, everyone.